Has Carlos Mendoza's management of the Mets bullpen cost this team games? I'll talk about it on today's show. You are Locked On Mets, your daily New York Mets podcast. Part of the Locked On Podcast Network, your team every day. Hello to all you amazing Mets fans. You're watching Locked On Mets. Part of the Locked On Podcast Network, your team every day. I'm your host, Ryan Finkelstein. If you want to find any of my work, follow me on X at Finkelstein Ryan. You can also find some of my writing at JustBaseball.com, where I work as the managing editor. Today's episode is brought to you by FanDuel. Make every moment more. This summer, FanDuel is hooking up all customers with a boost or a bonus daily. That's right. There's something for everyone every day, all summer long. Visit FanDuel.com to get started. We saw another good pitcher's duel on Monday, Christian Scott versus Mitch Keller, very reminiscent of a lot of games that we've seen throughout this road trip. Really good start by a Mets starter as well as one on the other side. Mets lineup doesn't break through. Bullpen cost the team the game. Now, you look at how it all played out, and there was a lot of questions about how Carlos Mendoza managed his bullpen, and we will get to that. But first things first, let's acknowledge that Christian Scott was brilliant in this start retires the first nine batters that he faces. And in the third inning, he strikes out Jared Triolo. And I want to hold myself accountable the same way I'm going to try to hold Carlos Mendoza accountable. I made a mistake. I jinxed Christian Scott. I'm going to own it. I'm going to own it. Because in that at-bat against Jared Triolo to end that third inning, he throws him eight straight fastballs. He swings and misses at two of the first three, continues to go to the well in the fastball, isn't putting him away ends up throwing a front door sweeper to strike him out. And that pitch was absolutely disgusting. He stapled Triolo's feet to the ground by throwing a sweeper that started at his back and broke in and was a strike on the inside corner. An absolutely perfect pitch. And I was foolish enough to send a text to Arm Layton after that strikeout. Now, for those of you who don't know who Arm Layton is, he is the co-founder of Just Baseball where I work, and he's a prospect analyst. He spends all of his time watching prospect videos, paying attention to everything going in the prospect world. His top 100 is as thorough as you're going to find. And he had Christian Scott on that top 100 before any other publication has him somewhere in the top twenties right now. He has been higher on Christian Scott than any analyst out there. So I was foolish enough to say, Hey man, Christian Scott's dealing. You might want to check it out. And in that text, I said, I don't know how righties can possibly handle him. Lefties can still get to him. But righties with that sweeper, that gyro slider, he's just got so many weapons that he can go to that they just don't have a chance. And the numbers back that up. Righties this year hitting 160 against Christian Scott. Lefties 279. But I put it in the text that lefties can get to him. Fourth inning, what happens? Well, first things first, Andrew McCutcheon has a great at bat against Christian Scott. And I was thinking during that bat, like, can you imagine what that's like for Christian Scott to be pitching against Andrew McCutcheon? Kind of a crazy moment, I'm sure. He ends up losing him, though. He gets ahead on him, loses him. Great at bat by McCutcheon. He draws a walk. Brian Reynolds, first pitch swing and flies out. So here comes O'Neill Cruz, a big, hulking lefty. And Christian Scott battles him, ends up trying to get him out with a splitter. And that's the issue. There's just not an out pitch against lefties yet. The splitter is his best one, as well as just an elevated fastball. But that's something he's got to work on. He's got to work on continuing to refine that splitter so that he can have it as an effective out pitch against lefties or develop something else. But this was a really you know, pivotal at bat. Throws the splitter, gets up a little bit too much in the zone. And it wasn't even a horrible pitch. It was located on the outside part of the plate, but just a little bit too elevated. And O'Neill Cruz puts it in the seats for a two-run home. Now, with that said, that was the only hit that Christian Scott allowed, and the walk to McCutcheon was the only walk that he allowed. He was great beyond that. After Cruz's home run, he retires the next seven batters that he faces. But this leads us back to Carlos Mendoza and how he managed the bullpen. Because Christian Scott, in the sixth inning, gets the first two outs. The second one was Andrew McCutcheon, another deep at bat. It went seven pitches. That pushed Christian Scott's pitch count to 77 on the day. He goes and he pulls him. Now, everybody that is complaining that Christian Scott should have stayed in that game, I'm sure Carlos Mendoza shares a similar sentiment. I'm sure he would have loved nothing more 
then they keep his young pitcher on the hill to get through six. The problem there is your top prospect on the mound. Top pitching prospect, but you can even make an argument at this point, he might be the top prospect in the system. Regardless, the organization is going to protect Christian Scott. He's thrown on four days rest for the first time in his career at the big league level, only the second time all season. Only did it once in the minor leagues right before he made his MLB debut. So this was a huge test for him, and he threw 99 pitches in his last start, and he's got to throw on regular rest the next time. So Christian Scott only had 75 pitches to give. And he got the 77. So you can't, as the manager, unilaterally decide to keep him in the game because what if Brian Reynolds is a 10 pitch at bat and all of a sudden the kid's pitch count goes to 87? The organization does not want that. So that's that's out of Mendoza's hands. Now the question then becomes, should he have gone to Eric Orsi? And we're going to talk about his other options in the next segment. But basically, you end up going to another rookie to make his MLB debut in a tie game. Because Brandon Nemo hit a two-run homer uh, in the prior inning there where he had a 3-0 pitch, was swinging all the way. Awesome to see him ambush there. And that tied the game. He drove in Harrison Bader, had a base hit. So it was all tied up at 2-2. Here comes Eric Orzi to face Brian Reynolds and make his MLB debut. And he throws nothing but change-ups in this at bat. And I actually want to put up the, the pitch chart. To show that as much as you can complain about the results, Eric Orsi did not fail to execute against Brian Reynolds. He was throwing nothing but change-ups, yes, and maybe he could have mixed in a fastball, fine. But there's only one pitch in that entire bat, it's the fifth pitch that he threw, that was not competitive. Everything else is located right where you would want a change-up split, um, which is what Orsi throws, that's his specialty. And the pitch that he walks Brian Reynolds on, the 3-2 pitch, that actually is touching the zone. That was a missed call by the umpire. Granted, it's just barely touching the zone. It's borderline. It could have gone either way. But if Orzi gets that call, it's a strikeout. He's in the dugout, and no one is complaining about what Carlos Mendoza decided to do. And instead, we're all talking about, wow, Eric Orzi, huh? Probably goes back out the next thing. Maybe he gets him out, and all of a sudden, the entire narrative is different. But it's a walk. Then O'Neill Cruz comes up. Cruz has been locked in throughout the series. He has a great at-bat, works a full count, hits a well-struck single on a fastball that was dotted up and away. It wasn't even a bad pitch. Ryan Telez comes up. He hits a cue shot on a shifted infield where Mark Vientos makes a diving stop where a shortstop should be in a traditional infield and has to get up, try to make a quick throw, ends up just being a step too late. Telez able to, to reach and run scores. But... If Reynolds is rung up on that one pitch, 3-2 pitch, or if Ryan Teles stumbles out of the box, the way we saw Jeff McNeil and others in this game struggling to get out of the box, the Mets get out of the inning. But instead, they don't. Adrian Hauser comes on and pitches with runners on out of the bullpen for the first time all year. He gives up a double. He throws a wild pitch, gives up a home run, 7-2 Pirates. Did Carlos Mendoza make a mistake? That's what we're going to be talking about in the next segment. I'm going to go through this entire road trip, game by game, and check out Mendoza's bullpen management so we can decide if this is a problem that the Mets have moving forward. They have a manager that's a rookie that just doesn't know what he has in that bullpen and is making all the wrong calls. I'm going to go through it game by game. But ultimately, I think we have to, at some point, take a minute to step back and Acknowledge that there's another team on the other side who played a great series. The fact that the Mets even got two games in the series feels like a good break to me because it easily could have gone the other way. The Pirates were locked in from teeing off on Severino to uh, you know j- having great arms come out of the bullpen at times to getting really good starting pitching, playing good defense. I mean, grinding out at bats. They had a very good series. It might be a team that's below 500, but they didn't play like it in this series. And in this game, their best hitters, O'Neill Cruz, Brian Reynolds, Andrew McCutcheon, they all had really good at-bats to put the Mets in some bad spots. And then ultimately, yes, Adrian Hauser has a blow-up and the bullpen looks awful and Orsi didn't get the outs. But I look at what the Mets had here and how it all shaked out and – I don't really blame Mendoza for it. I want to talk about that a little bit more in the next segment. What else could he have done in this spot? 
and also throughout the rest of this road trip, did he make any other mistakes? So we're going to go through all of it. First, though, a word from our sponsors. Today's episode is brought to you by FanDuel. I love sports. I love them so much. I never want them to stop. But as the playoffs have winded down, we get fewer games. And the sports are not sports in the way I like them to. But FanDuel lets me keep the sports going whenever I want because all I have to do is open the app and dream up bets anytime I'm in the mood. And this summer, FanDuel is hooking up all customers with a boost or a bonus daily. That's right. There's something for everyone every day all summer long. So head over to FanDuel.com slash locked on and start making the most out of your summer. FanDuel, the official sports betting partner of Major League Baseball. If you're an everyday listener to the show, make sure you become a Locked On Mets insider. This is our texting service where you get updates from me anytime some news breaks on the Mets. You can ask me questions anytime and you get these starting lineup graphics sent to your phone every day. If you want to be a Locked On Mets insider, find the link in the episode description. Go to subtext.com slash Locked On Mets. All right, so when Carlos Mendoza goes to the bullpen, what are his options when he pulls Christian Scott? Because, again, that decision was not his. So you can complain all you want that Christian Scott should be allowed to stay in that game and get the final out. Blame David Stearns in the front office. That's not Mendoza's fault. So who should he have gone to? Would you have preferred he went to Jake Diekman? Because Jake Diekman sucks. I'm just going to call it as I see it at this point. Not good. Could he have gone to Jose Budo? Potentially, but he pitched more recently than Adrian Hauser did. I think the plan was always to have Hauser carry those innings after Christian Scott, leading up to Adam Adovino, but I imagine he was holding for a save, potentially. Those were his options for the day. Budo, Hauser, Adovino, and Orzi, and Diekman. Those are the guys he can go to. Now, Orzi has pitched much better in the minor leagues against lefties than righties because he has that change-up, that split, whatever you want to call it. It's a good weapon against left-handed uh, hitting. So Orzi is right now in this bullpen, a guy that the Mets are viewing as a lefty specialist of sorts, and you had lefties coming up. You say, oh, you can't pitch him in a 2-2 two to -two game, but that's playing the results because there's nobody on the bases. There's two outs. Let's go in there and get an out. I don't think that's the worst situation to put Orzi in. Would it be better to put him in the next inning? If Christian Scott got the final out and he got Brian Reynolds out, the next inning he's got to face uh, O'Neill Cruz and Rowdy Tellez. Are you just not pitching him in the game at all? When you have no Garrett, no Nunez, no Diaz, it changes things in that bullpen. You have to make tougher decisions. You just don't have as many cards you can go to. So I don't think that he did anything wrong in this game to cost the Mets. Now, did Orsi make some mistakes? I guess, but it really was just good at bats from the Pirates. Did Hauser make mistakes? Yeah, plenty of them. But he's not used to coming in with runners on as a starting pitcher. So, and you say, oh, well, Hauser's been great in the bullpen throughout his career. That's overstated a little bit. I talked about this when he actually made the change. Yes, he has been very good in the bullpen throughout his career. But he has been primarily a starting pitcher for the last like four years prior to this. So to say that he has that experience to rely on, I wouldn't even go that far. So to say, oh, you should have just gone straight to Hauser, you're playing the results. Because Adrian Hauser is the one that gave up all the hard hit balls. Brian Reynolds might have taken him deep. O'Neill Cruz might have taken him deep. I don't think that Mendoza made a mistake on Monday. So let's go throughout the road trip. On Sunday, did he make a mistake? Sean I was dealing at 89 pitches through six innings. He goes to read Garrett in the seventh. Now, Garrett got through it, but it was dicey. Could you have instead pitched Manai in that seventh? Sure. This year, though, facing a lineup the first time through, batters are hitting 212 against Sean Manai. Second time through, 200. Third time through, 281. You're playing the numbers and the fact that Manai typically is going to get worse as the game goes on, particularly when the lineup is seeing him a third time. And Garrett actually got through that inning still. And then ultimately they make the decision with two outs to pull Nunez to bring in Edwin Diaz. Edwin Diaz walks a batter, gives up a soft hit single. That blows the game, blows the save. But luckily the Mets battle back and Diaz holds on to get the, the uh, win, not the save, but to hold on to a one-run lead in the ninth inning. Did Mendoza make a mistake there? Yeah, I would have liked to see Nunez stay on and get the final out. 
but he got Edwin Diaz hot. And as he said after the game, I'm going to my closer there. It's a four out save opportunity. And that's what he should be doing in some respects because it's Edwin Diaz's responsibility to get that out. He's a hundred million dollar closer. That, that's his job to go in there to put out that fire and to get the final three outs of the game. And he actually got the final three outs of the game, holding a one run lead. So that part of it worked out. I'm not blaming Mendoza or anything that happened on Sunday. The Mets won the game Saturday. David Peterson, four and a third to Jose Budo for five outs to Garrett, to Nunez, to Diaz. Almost looked like the Mets have a good bullpen for a day. It really did. Like, oh, wow, it, it, it worked. <laughs> Budo got you through the middle innings, and then you had a 7 8 9 to go to for the first time all year. No complaints there, right? The Mets got a win. Friday, Luis Severino blew a 2 nothing lead. Then he gave up two more runs in the fifth. So it's 4 to 2. You try to get him through seven, he gets through the six, no problem. Seventh inning, the fly ball, the Harrison Bader should have caught, turns into a double, gives up another hit, loads the bases, and then they go to Jake Diekman in a 4-2 to two game with the bases loaded, nobody out. Now, that did not work out for the Mets. But I think in that spot, what is Carlos Mendoza deciding? He's looking at Severino, who's spiraling at 91 pitches, saying, let's get him out of there. Okay, well, are you going to burn one of those pitchers that you end up using on Saturday, Garrett Nunez-Diaz? Well, actually, they didn't have Diaz available. It would have been Garrett or Nunez. I don't even think Nunez was on the table based on how he had pitched before that. You don't have a lot of options in a shorthanded bullpen. And Jake Diekman is the lefty that you can go to and hopefully he pitches out of it. He gives up a grand slam and ended up being awful. But you blame Diekman there. I don't necessarily blame Mendoza because it was a losing battle anyway. Four to two, bases loaded, nobody out. You're probably going to lose that game. Throw out Diekman. Who cares? You blow the game. It ends up looking awful. But I don't blame him for that. All right, so that, that covers... The series against the Pirates. First game, if Severino pitches better, you might win. Final game of the series, yes, it didn't work, but the Mets had a shorthanded bullpen, and they didn't score really any runs outside of Nimmo's home run. They did not score, and Mitch Keller got through eight innings. He looked unbelievable. Great starting pitching against the Mets throughout this entire road trip. So, yeah, no complaints. All right, so now you go to Thursday. This was the game where Jesse Winker hit the late home run against Adrian Hauser. Jose Quintana deals through seven. They go to Hauser in the eighth. He gives up a home run. Well, you had a shorthanded bullpen. Hauser's been great throughout the season. Jesse Winker came in as a pinch hitter, and you could say, oh, you should have held up four fingers. I talked about this on that edition of the show on Friday morning where I talked about how you just don't put the game-winning run on base with one out. You just don't do it. That that's just a baseball no-no. And throughout his career, while Winker had owned Adrian Hauser, in 77% of the plate appearance between those two guys, a home run was not hit. Now, other side of that, 23% of the time, it was. But you're playing the odds that at least he can hopefully keep the ball in the yard. He's been throwing the ball really well lately, and it didn't work out. And maybe that's something we got to monitor. Adrian Hauser, a couple of rough outings in a row. But I'm not blaming Mendoza for that. I'm just not. Wednesday, Christian Scott on the mound. Mets spot him five runs. He gives up a run of the fifth. Sixth inning, they're trying to push Christian Scott because they had him for a full amount of pitches. Gets the first out, gives up two hits, gets a pop out. Then he has to face Luis Garcia. He ends up giving up a crushing three-run home. But I want to circle back to that game because I want to look at the first game of the series and the second game to then really analyze what the Mets could have done differently in that game where Christian Scott ultimately starts what ends up becoming later a bullpen meltdown and the Mets lose. First game of the series, the Mets win in extras. Daniel Nunez needs to get five outs in that game through 23 pitches. Reed Garrett pitched in that game as well. Tyler J could not hold on for the Mets because they scored six runs in extra innings. He's starting to give up a ton, so that forced Garrett into the game. Second game of the series, Mets get a good start from Manaya. Jose Budo pitches two innings. That takes the Mets to extras. They grab a big lead. And Nunez had already gotten up because they didn't know they were going to have as big of a lead as they did. And once you get Nunez hot, a day after he had thrown 23 pitches, you sort of have to throw him. Otherwise, he's going to be burned anyway. So either you take the opportunity to pitch him or you throw somebody else out there to start the extra inning. Maybe it would have been Budo, right? You could have said, all right, you should have just kept Budo in the game. Well, if Budo ends up giving up three hits, and it gets dicey, 
You want to go to Nunez anyway, guess what? Now you got to get him hot again. That's just not a great way to manage a guy that they got to be careful with in Nunez, who's already pushing up against, I think, a career high in innings pitch. I mean, I have to look at that, but he's throwing a lot of innings. And I think that his career high previously is like 60 innings. So you got to be careful with him. So in that spot, you get him hot, you got to use him. And it gets them a victory. Great. So now you circle back to the decision on Christian Scott. You don't have Nunez to pitch. You don't have Budo to pitch. So when you look at the options they had in that game, they had Adam Adovino, okay, and he gets the final out of the sixth inning. The seventh, he gets the first two outs, and then they pull him for Jake Diekman. This was the one time where I had a gripe with Carlos Mendoza, and I talked about it on the show. Because C.J. Abrams has slightly better splits against left-handed pitching, hitting 330 on the year at the time. Compared to, I think, like 280 against righties. The big difference, though, is a little more power left on right than left on left. So I think what Mendoza is thinking in that spot is you bring in Diekman. He has a better chance of keeping the ball in the yard in a close game than Adovino does, right? One run game, you don't want Abrams at home run. He's the guy you're scared of in that lineup. He's their best player. He's their all star. Well, the reason why I had a problem with it is because Lane Thomas is standing on deck and there's a 300-point discrepancy between his OPS first right-handed pitching and left-handed pitching. He crushes lefties, not even really a good hitter against righties. I would have kept Adam Adovino in there, pitched carefully to Abrams, and I get the nervous or the, the apprehension to do that because Adovino can absolutely serve up a home run ball to Abrams. But even in that moment, it's a tie game. Instead, he goes to Diekman, he walks Abrams, Gives up a double to Thomas. That blows the lead. Then James Wood gets a base hit. And that scores a run. I would have saved Diekman to face Wood. And it wouldn't matter because Diekman still is not effective. So the Mets have a Jake Diekman problem for sure. But do they have a Carlos Mendoza problem? Not necessarily. And then they go to Ty Adcock in the following. And he gives up a home run as well. But you were already losing at that point. So why burn Reed Garrett potentially? And remember, they were still pitching short without Edwin Diaz. Ultimately, when you look at this road trip, there was great pitching against the Mets throughout the road trip. Mackenzie Gore, DJ Herz, uh, uh, Jake Irvin was lights out. Uh, Mitch Keller in this final game, Paul Skeens. Really tough pitching going up against the Mets. Now, that's not an excuse, but... This lineup has been clicking for a while. J.D. Martinez dealing with an ankle injury. Harrison Bader crashing into a wall. You don't have Starling Marte. You're you're rolling out a lineup that's not quite as good as the one that has been killing all pitchers throughout the the month of June, leading into July here. A 4-4 road trip is not the worst thing in the world. And when it comes to Carlos Mendoza, why there has been some games like that one where he goes to Diekman instead of keeping Adovino in there, where I can nitpick and say, yeah, I don't like what he did in this particular instance. Do I think that he is bad at managing the bullpen? I think that a bad bullpen will make you look bad at managing the bullpen more than I think he has an issue. I think the Mets bullpen problem is more about the arms that are in the bullpen than how he's been managing them. While there has been some questionable decisions, as I just went through an eight-game road trip, there was only one that I think was inexcusable. But even then, I was still able to find some, some reasons for why he made the decision that he did. So I don't think the Mets have a Carlos Mendoza problem. I think he has kept his team locked in all season long despite a ton of peaks and valleys. And I think he's a pretty damn good rookie manager. So for all of you who hate the way he's managing the bullpen, who want to blame him, it's easy to blame the manager when the bullpen doesn't perform, but I don't think it is his fault. Now I want to look ahead to the rest of this week, two series at home to close out the first half. Can the Mets end on a really positive note? I'll preview lies ahead in just a minute. First though, a word from our sponsors. Today's episode is brought to you by Prize Picks. Prize Picks is the easiest and most exciting way to play daily fantasy sports. Unlike other apps on Prize Picks, it's just you against the numbers. All you do is pick more or less on two to six player stat projections, 
You watch the winnings roll in. Get in on the daily action with your friends and become part of the Prize Picks community today. You can now win up to a hundred times your money on Prize Picks with as little as four correct picks. You can turn ten dollars into a thousand dollars. If you're looking for promotions, Prize Picks has got you covered every week. Today's Tuesday. From lowering select player stat projections on Tuesday to help your line of pit, that's something you can take advantage of, or getting your entry fees back if you have a losing lineup on Fridays. Prize Picks is there for you. Download the Prize Picks app today. Use the code Locked on MLB for a first deposit match up to $100. That's code Locked on MLB on the Prize Picks app for a first deposit match up to $100. Pick more, pick less. It's that easy with Prize Picks. Today's episode is also brought to you by Tax Network USA. Here with Locked On Mets, we pride ourselves on getting you the latest news for your team, whether it's the offseason, the draft, spring training, or the playoffs. It's year-round. You know what else is year-round? Collection season. Just because tax season is over doesn't mean the IRS will stop coming after you for unfiled taxes. The IRS can garnish your wages, levy your bank accounts, can even seize your property. Don't let the IRS target you. Let the licensed professionals and tax experts at Tax Network USA go to bat for you. With over 14 years of experience and an A-plus rating by the Better Business Bureau, Tax Network USA has saved their clients over $1 billion in tax debt. Whether you owe taxes, have complicated matters that require tax planning, or finally hit that parlay this season and need help correctly filing, go call 1-800-549-1000 or visit tnusa.com slash locked on. You can also just see the link in the episode description below. If you want to stay up to date with all the latest in the world of sports, make sure you check out Locked On Sports Today, streaming 24-7 on YouTube. So the Mets now have a six-game homestand to close out the first half. Three games against the Nationals, three against the Colorado Rockies. The Nationals, since we last saw them last week, uh, they played the Cardinals in a four-game set. They lost three of four games. They are now on the season 42-49, and clinging to playoff hopes. The Mets are 44 and 45. This is their opportunity to really put the Nationals away. Also, if you think about the season series, what do you play these days? Is it 13 games against your division rival? I'm pretty sure. Don't quote me on that. It's either 13 or 14. I think it's 13, though. And so far, the Mets have won five. So you win a series, you win the season series. There's still one more series later in the season against the Nats. Big, big matchup here. And you have a lot of rematches. First one, rematch of Independence Day, 4th of July, Jake Irvin versus Jose Quintana. Irvin absolutely carved with the Mets, but that was an early morning game. Quintana carved with the Nationals that day. I bet you both of these pitchers turn in starts that are not nearly as good this time around. And hopefully the Mets lineup can click and really start to score runs the way they had earlier um, you know, in June and even earlier this month against the Yankees and the Astros briefly. Uh, for that, this game, when it comes to the Mets bullpen, you should have Nunez, Garrett, and Diaz ready. They each got a day of rest, although I don't know if they're going to go to all of those guys, maybe save one of them if possible. Jose Budo should also be rested. So if I had to guess the strategy going in, it's probably you know, get five or six out of Quintana. If you're lucky, you get seven again. Great. Go to Jose Budo for those middle innings. And then depending on the score, you got Adam Adovino rested or you got your high leverage relievers in Nunez, Garrett, and Diaz to hopefully lock down a late lead if you have one. I think they'll stay away from Adrian Hauser. I'd imagine unless the score is not in their favor, they'd probably stay away, stay away from Diekman and Orzi as well. I think the only way he gets into the game is if it's lopsided in either direction, um, assuming that he stays on the roster. But I don't think they're going to drop him down just yet. I think they want to see, see him again and see what he can do. Again, if you look at the pitches that he made, he was not failing on execution to a massive degree. It's tough to go out there. He's got an infinity ERA right now, has not recorded an out yet. I think he's better than that, obviously. Uh, but I, I thought he actually threw the ball fairly well considering all the circumstances, as I already alluded to earlier in the show. Now the next game, Patrick Corbin versus Luis Severino. This is another matchup. We saw this at the beginning of this great run of baseball for the Mets when they completed their sweep against the Nationals in D.C. and Corbin got destroyed by Louis Terenz and the rest of the Mets. Hopefully that can happen again. He is not a very good starting pitcher. And Severino needs to bounce back after a rough start against Pittsburgh, and he had a great start against the Nationals. 
when those two guys squared off last time. Final game of the series, Mackenzie Gore versus David Peterson. Another rematch. We just saw this pitching matchup the last time these two teams squared off. Peterson got the edge uh, because Mackenzie Gore was not allowed to face Mark Vientos. And then I think it was Derek Law. Regardless, uh, that was where the Mets put up a three spot that inning in the sixth to give Peterson a lead. Peterson pitched into the seventh inning before they went to Jose Budo and they ultimately won that game in extras. Now, Gore's a really good pitcher, tough matchup for a rubber match. So hopefully the Mets handle their business early, take the first two games of this series, make it a little bit easier on themselves when they're going up against maybe one of the Nationals aces because it's hard for me to look at Jake Irvin as anything but their ace, the way he pitched against the Mets last time. Tough series with those two guys going, really is. Hopefully the Mets can do the best they can to get a serious victory. And then you got the Rockies coming into town, and that's a series that you got to really do some damage in. Hopefully the Mets can take all of those games potentially, but even just winning both of these series. If you take four of six for the rest of this week here, you're going to go into the all-star break one game over 500, sitting in a pretty good position to at least not sell at the deadline, but potentially conservatively buy. Um, really just hopefully help this bullpen out. I think that's all the Mets have to do. Uh, yeah, it'd be nice to get another bat in the lineup, but realistically with where they're at on this team, I don't think they have to do anything but sure up the pen. So we'll see how the rest of this week works out and what's going to happen before the trade deadline. I'll be with you throughout the way. Also, actually, one last note uh, that I wanted to, to, to mention before the, the show closes here. I loved Brandon Nimmo's home run and more than just hitting the home run. The way that he came into the dugout, the sly smile on his face when he held the OMG sign, the way he comes in, high fives his teammates, hugs Francisco Lindor. I don't know. There's part of me that believes there is a chip on the shoulder of those two guys, Lindor and Nemo. The fact that neither of them was selected to the all-star game. And with Pete Alonzo, it's sort of weird. Obviously, I talked about this a lot on yesterday's show, but the fact that he was selected over those guys, not that I think that's going to cause any riff in the clubhouse. I, I think they're too locked in to do that. But Lindor and Nemo have become the real leaders of this team. I think it's great that they have a chip on their shoulder through this all-star thing. I think it can kind of work in the Mets' favor. And with Pete Alonso, maybe there's something to prove here. Prove you are an all-star. Have a great finish to this season. So while I was very frustrated about those results, I think there is a world where the fact that the all-star broke the way it did, it might end up playing to the Mets' favor with their three most important players. That's going to be all for the show today, though. Appreciate all of you who tuned in. If you are watching on YouTube, do me a favor. Hit that subscribe button. Want to get to 9,000 subs by the All-Star break. There's a week left here. We're within 100 subscribers, so I appreciate all of you who continue to subscribe. Uh, if you're listening on the audio side, follow, rate, review, wherever you get your podcast. If you want to follow me on social, you can do so at Finkelstein Ryan. Follow the show at Locked On Mets. Thank you for making Locked On Mets your first listener, your first watch every day. Now for your second watch. Head over to YouTube and check out the first ever 24-7 streaming channel that covers everything in the world of sports with our local experts from each team and our league-wide experts from each league. Find Locked On Sports Today streaming 24-7 on YouTube and on Amazon Fire TV.